sliver of land off the coast of Nova Scotia that would entice the wealthy and the wise to give up their fortunes, indeed, their very lives. Can it be that all the modern engineering in the world today can't get to the bottom of a pit dug here over 200 years ago? The money pit was no small feat of engineering. Whoever built it needed to have the technology and he also needed to have the manpower and the resources. It would have taken at least a hundred men several months to complete the money pit. The legends about the island are many. Some of the more famous ones are that the treasure will not be found until seven people have died. As of to date, there have been six killed in the search. Perhaps the most famous legend is that no one will find the treasure until every oak tree on the island is gone. As of right now, there's one. What treasure is large enough to bring a young Franklin Delano Roosevelt to the island with a pick and shovel in hand? Or cause the great matinee idol Errol Flynn to leave the luxury of Hollywood for the cold and mud of an obscure island? Is this the repository of the world's greatest single treasure or just some 18th century engineer's idea of a practical joke? Just off the coast of Nova Scotia lies a tiny blip of land called Oak Island. It would be hard to imagine a more nondescript piece of real estate, yet here on this mile-long, half-mile-wide chunk of dirt that sticks up out of the Atlantic Ocean barely 35 feet, fortunes have been squandered and so far six lives have been lost. In search of what? That's one of the more amazing parts of this mystery. No one even knows what they're looking for. Oh, there are theories to be sure, but the bottom line is nobody knows. That's what makes the mystery of Oak Island one of the most convoluted, puzzling, strange, yet true stories we have ever encountered. It all began in 1795. A teenager by the name of Daniel McGuinness noted a depression under the outstretched branch of one of the large oak trees from which the island originally took its name. Daniel and two friends he had persuaded to join him quickly discovered that indeed someone at some time in the distant past had gone to a great deal of trouble to dig the pit they were now uncovering. Every 10 feet, they encountered another oak floor solidly anchored in the sides of the pit. By the time they had reached the third floor, and in spite of dizzying visions of buried treasure, they realized they were in over their heads, both literally and figuratively. Curiously, that seemed to end the boys' adventure. They just gave up. For the next seven years, the pit the boys had only begun to uncover lay undisturbed. But rumors abounded, some of them quite sinister. There was talk of a curse on Oak Island, which might not be as far-fetched as it sounds when you begin to learn a bit about the island's tragic history. Well, one of the main legends is that uh, there is a pack of dogs on the island uh, with fiery eyes that roam the island to protect the treasure pit. Also, uh, a crow that may be the embodiment of some other spirit. Supposedly, he watches over the money pit. You've also got um, the legend that the treasure will never be found until seven people have died. And so far, six have died. But perhaps the most famous legend is that no one will find the treasure until every oak tree on the island is gone. As of right now, there's one. We really don't know what happened when the money pit was found or what the original story was. Over the last 200 years, folklore has intruded to change the story dramatically to the point where it's very difficult to separate fact from fiction. Yet in spite of legends and curses, men keep pouring their lives and fortunes into this hole in the ground. Why? Some researchers think it is nothing more than a sinkhole. I don't think it was a sinkhole. I know it was for the simple reason that Oak Island is no more than 500 feet from the mainland where the mainland is peppered with sinkholes. I have been in uh, several of them. If that's true, it's a sinkhole that has fooled a lot of people. 
The boys eventually convinced others that there was something of value buried on the island, and in 1803, they returned to the original pit, but as hired hands with the Onslow Company. The Onslow Company brought to the island a full complement of men and equipment, believing they could quickly find whatever treasure there was to be found. The crew began to dig, McGinnis and his two friends among them, and amazingly, they continued to find layers of oak logs at each new 10-foot depth. But they also encountered layers of charcoal, putty, and a fibrous material that fired their imagination. It was strands of coconut fiber used by ships to protect valuable cargo. To this point, they had found only clay and oak logs, but the coconut fibers gave them new hope. Since there wasn't a coconut tree within 1,500 miles, someone from far distant shores had to have brought it there. Hiram Walker, who was working in the money pit at the time, told his granddaughter that he saw bushels of a substance that was later identified as coconut fiber being taken out of the shaft. Now that was strange because the nearest coconuts were 1,500 miles away. Here too, at about 90 feet, they uncovered a large flat stone with two lines of strange geometric symbols inscribed on it. An inverted triangle, followed by an inverted triangle with two diagonal lines through it, followed by a slash with tiny circles above and below the line, another triangle, and a downward pointing arrow. The inscription was shown to a language professor at the University of Halifax, who translated the markings as saying, 40 feet below, two million pounds are buried. A translation that would be confirmed years later by a reference to Edgar Allan Poe. But that was not the only translation. The writing, uh, translated to the English, is from the writings of the Coptic Christians. Now, the Coptic Christians were very early Christians, and uh, they were linearly uh, descended from the ancient Egyptians. The inscription is translated by Dr. Barry Fell, and it reads, The people shall not forget the Lord. To offset the hardships of winter and the onset of plague, the Arif, he shall pray to the Lord. Now, and Arif was a sub-priest in the Coptic religion. Harry Marshall, who helped to carry the stone out of the shaft, said it was not like anything he'd ever seen in Nova Scotia. In fact, he thought it was a form of porphyry. Not very common, but you can find it in Egypt. Is it really possible that Egyptians reached North America in the distant past? How did a rare kind of rock found almost exclusively in Egypt find its way to Oak Island and into this enigmatic pit? The questions without answers keep mounting, yet it is only now that the mystery of the island really begins. When the Onslow Company reached the 110-foot level, an iron rod was used to probe beyond the log floor but it would only go about a yard before it hit wood of another kind. Could it be the treasure chest? By the time they struck the object, it was too dark to work, so they quit for the day, believing that in the morning the treasure would be in their hands. Oak Island is in roughly the shape of a peanut, narrowing down to 400 yards at its narrowest point. The pit, now being called the Money Pit because of the many legends of pirate treasure that are part of the folk heritage of that area, lies just a few hundred yards from the shore near a small bay on the narrow end of the island. This proximity to the ocean seemed of little consequence as the men returned to the pit the next morning to claim their hard-won prize. Imagine their surprise and disappointment when they discovered the pit was filled with about 60 feet of water. Disappointed but undaunted, the men began bailing the water out with buckets, but it soon became apparent they were making no progress at all. They might as well have been trying to empty the Atlantic Ocean, which in fact they were, even though they didn't know it at the time. They even tried dropping a heavy-duty pump into the pit, but when they turned it on, it burst before the water even reached the surface. 
Then someone noticed that the level of water in the pit raised and lowered with the tide. Somehow, the hard clay of the island that had kept the Atlantic Ocean at bay for eons had sprung a leak. Without knowing it, the Onslow Company, in its efforts to get to the bottom of the puzzle, had broken a very old but very effective hydraulic seal. When they removed the tightly fitted oak platforms, especially the one just below the strange stone with its enigmatic message, some unknown mechanism led in the ocean. Others would later discover that it was planned that way and with considerable genius. But at this point, the lure of the treasure just seemed to grow as the complexity of the task of obtaining grew. Surely no one in the 17th or 18th century would go to all this trouble for a few gold doubloons and a box of jewels. Whatever was there must be of immense, perhaps even unmeasurable value. What could be at the bottom of this water-filled hole in the ground? Could there be some rare Egyptian treasure hiding in the depths? Or could it be that whoever designed this seemingly impenetrable scheme put something there that was never meant to be recovered? But surely, what some 17th century engineer could design, our modern engineers and technology could easily overcome. As far back as there are records, it seems Oak Island has been cloaked in an air of mystery. The first settlers in the area believed the island was haunted. They reported that on dark nights, they could see eerily glowing lights over the island. A story from the mid-1800s tells of two fishermen who went to investigate lights on the island and were never seen again. Is all this just legend? Stories told to scare children? Or is there more here than just buried pirate treasure? Does the mystery of the island go beyond the physical world we know into some unknown dark realm? They say curiosity killed the cat, but in the case of Oak Island, it killed more than a cat. The water proved too much for the Onslow Company, and they shut down their effort. It was haying time, and the men had more important things to do. Now totally discouraged, John Smith took the stone with the enigmatic markings and eventually used it in his fireplace. And where is it today? No man knows where the stone is. People have been hunting for it for a long time. It was last seen in a print shop in Halifax around the turn of the century where it was being used for the stropping of leather or something like that. Interest in the treasure seemed to disappear with the stone. It would be 45 years before anyone challenged the money pit again. Then in 1849, a company called the Truro Company brought a new crew and new determination to the island. McGinnis had died but Smith and Vaughn could still point out the original shaft. But this time, the Truro Company decided to see if they could find out if anything was really there before sinking another shaft. They had brought with them hand-operated pod augers, the kind that were used in those days to prospect for coal. Relying on directions provided by Smith and Vaughn, they ran the auger down and struck the platform Smith and Vaughn told them would be there at precisely 98 feet. The bit then dropped 12 inches and hit another four inches of oak, and then went through 22 inches of loose metal. The auger then hit another four inches of oak and six inches of spruce. From there on down to 112 feet, there was only clay. According to records kept by the company, something was definitely there between 98 and 105 feet. They eagerly retrieved the auger, anxious for clues as to the size and composition of the treasure. But what they found was yet another mystery. There were two times uh, in the 1800s when searchers thought they drilled into treasure chests. One was in 1849 when they thought they drilled through two chests, one on top of the other. And the other one was in 1897 when they thought they drilled into one big chest which had different measurements from the other two. The auger did bring up two pieces of gold metal, very much like the links on a watch chain. But not everyone was convinced they had found treasure chests. Some think it may have been a coffin. In my opinion, these two pieces of metal that were taken up in their core possibly, not probably, but possibly came from chain mail armor that the Arif may have been using. Because chain mail armor 
in those days and before, a thousand years before, was still quite popular. And they probably dressed him up after he died in chainmail armor and put him in his final resting place. It might indeed be possible to imagine the pit as nothing more than an elaborate tomb for some ancient religious leader. But there's more, much more to the story. A subsequent bore brought up something that was a complete surprise, a piece of sheepskin parchment with the letters V and W on it. The Truro Company believed they had encountered a vault containing a wooden box or boxes of some kind. This box, if it exists, is between the 154 and 161 foot level and is reputedly the place the auger found the parchment. But 10 feet below that, according to the company records, is an impenetrable iron plate. Who could have built such an ingenious masterwork? And what treasure could justify such an enormous effort? Gold, jewels, money? And what about the strange piece of parchment? When Dr. Burl Ruth, a professor at Iowa State University, heard that parchment had been found in the money pit, he predicted that mercury would be found there too. Dr. Ruth, a chemical engineer, was an avid subscriber to the theory that Shakespeare was just a front, that it was actually Sir Francis Bacon that wrote the plays and poems attributed to Shakespeare. And Bacon had written on several occasions that mercury could be used to reserve almost anything of value, including manuscripts. So when Ruth heard about the piece of parchment that had come out of the pit, he concluded that this must be the repository Baconian scholars had been searching for for centuries. Ruth thought it entirely possible that a hoard of manuscripts would be found there that would prove once and for all that Francis Bacon was in fact the author of the so-called Shakespearean works. We are inclined to write this one off as just idle speculation except for a couple of nagging oddities that keep everyone guessing. For example, there's that business about the mercury. There has been a confirmation that people years ago did use mercury for preservation. And the uh, amount of uh, mercury that must have been on Oak Island would have been enough for uh, either smelting or some storage project that was pretty big. So far as anyone knows, Shakespeare was not a lawyer, nor well-traveled, nor educated. And he certainly lacked extensive life experience. Bacon, on the other hand, was all of those things, and in addition, was one of the leading scientists of his day. He would have the knowledge and skill to design and implement something as complex as Oak Island has turned out to be. Still, there is no direct evidence pointing to Bacon as either the author of Shakespeare's work or the designer of the Oak Island complex. But all of this only seemed to heighten the desire of the Truro Company to find out what was, in fact, in that hole in the ground. They decided to drill yet another shaft, this time to the northwest. Same solution, same result. At about 100 feet, water came rushing into the new shaft. This time, it took barely 20 minutes to fill the shaft. One of the workers on the island at the time discovered that there was an area along the beach where at low tide, water would bubble up from the ground. Of course, this was not natural. Apparently, what he had discovered was an opening into one of the flood tunnels. They started investigating along the beach. They found that underneath the rock and the sand, there was a layer of eelgrass and coconut fiber, apparently set there to use as a filtration system. They went ahead and built a dam, a rock dam called a coffer dam. This held back the tide and they were actually able to dig up the beach. As they did, they discovered that there was a series of box drains, approximately eight inches in diameter. These box drains were like the fingers on your hand, they formed a fan. They converged into one central location, and apparently that's what the feeder tunnels were for the flood tunnels. Unfortunately, before they could find the point where they converged, a storm came along, an Atlantic storm, and destroyed their dam. The Truro Company was certain they had discovered the key to the Oak Island mystery. However, lacking the time and resources to rebuild the dam, the company decided instead to sink another shaft about a hundred feet from Smith's Cove to intersect and plug the flood tunnel. But the men of the Truro Company hadn't even begun to understand the complexity of the task before them. 
Somebody had designed Smith's Cove as an enormous feeder system capable of taking 600 gallons of water per minute from the Atlantic Ocean into the money pit. The walls of this feeder system were four feet high and two and a half feet wide at a grade of 22 percent. The Smithsonian Institute examined the fibrous material and determined that it was indeed coconut husks and pointed out that it was especially resistant to seawater and might have been there in Smith's Cove for several hundred years. The company's idea of plugging the feeder tunnel was a good one. Unfortunately, they were only able to find one of the tunnels and they weren't able to plug that one completely. Someone had built a complex system of tunnels, drains and filters that worked on a simple principle that's known to every child. If you place your thumb over the top of a drinking straw and insert it into a glass of water, the water won't come up into the straw until you remove your thumb. And since we know how that works, the mystery is solved, right? Sorry to disappoint you, but even knowing how the flood trigger works, all the entrepreneurs, researchers, engineers, and treasure hunters over the past 150 years have so far been unable to put the water back in the glass. We can tell you, however, that like those who had gone before them, the Truro Company ran out of time and money and simply gave up. But what of more modern efforts to retrieve the treasure? Do we know yet what the prize is for which the treasure hunters have been willing to give up everything? Is it the treasure that still draws people to the money pit? Or is it the challenge of solving the puzzle? Are we any closer to a solution? Or does the money pit of Oak Island just generate more mystery? Treasure hunters have continued to return to Oak Island at varying intervals over the years, and while some pieces of the puzzle seem to have fallen into place, no one has yet been able to reach the treasure, whatever it is. Divers have managed to go down as deep as 235 feet into a vast chamber beneath the area of the money pit. They reported V-shaped gouges extending upward, and while they couldn't see the bottom, they could stand on it. Several treasure seekers, beginning with the Truro Company, believe they have solved the riddle of the water trap, but the results of these efforts have always been either disappointing, strangely bizarre, or tragic. By the mid-1800s, two workers had already lost their lives. One was killed when a steam boiler blew up, another when he fell down a steep shaft. But not even the superstition that seven people would die could keep the treasure seekers away. Tantalizing discoveries kept popping up, almost as if the island was teasing the treasure hunters, daring them not to quit. The island is covered with clues and markers showing that someone did something there a long time ago. Probably the most famous of these is the stone triangle that was found at South Shore Cove. This triangle, if you follow its measurements and follow its lines, mathematically it will take you straight to the site of the money pit. The Money Pit. Strange name for a hole in the ground that no one has taken a dime out of yet. Of course, if you look at it from the standpoint of the amount of money poured into it, it is aptly named indeed. And even some of the world's most unlikely treasure hunters have been willing to contribute their share. Over the years, there have been many famous people associated with the search and the island. In 1909, Franklin Roosevelt became involved with the search. He bought stock in a company called the Old Gold Salvage Company. He actually made two trips to the island to participate in the search. Of course, they were unsuccessful, but over the years, even as president, he still followed events on the island. And as late as 1939, he hoped to return to the island, but the impending war in Europe prevented this. Roosevelt's effort was merely unsuccessful. Others have not been so fortunate. They come knowing the history, even the nature of the problem. But somehow, they always seem certain that with the right tools and a sustained effort, they can succeed where all others have failed. We came to get the two treasures up. And uh, I would say that my convictions are stronger than ever that we can do it and will do it. Robert Restall and his wife Mildred had lived exciting and adventurous lives. Among other things, they had been daredevil motorcycle riders. The difficulties of Oak Island seemed almost trivial by comparison, yet they would discover that they had embarked on a journey that was far more dangerous than anything they had ever tried before. The work that we have done has shown us that this is a genuine proposition. There's nothing false about it, 
and is vaster by far than people ever imagined. We feel, I'm speaking for myself, I feel that the treasure is here and that we can get it and we're going to stay here until we do. Tragedy struck again in 1965 when Robert Restall, his son Robert Jr., Cyril Hiltz and Carl Gracer died in a pit by the shore of Smith's Cove as a result of poison gas. Oak Island had now claimed six lives. By now, the location of the original pit was completely obscured. Various boreholes were identified by number. Finding a small chest, or even a large chest, more than a hundred feet under the rock, mud, and clay of the island was taking on all the characteristics of the proverbial needle in a haystack. Then in 1967, a man by the name of Dan Blankenship, a Florida contractor, and a Montreal businessman, David Tobias, formed another treasure hunting syndicate called Triton Alliance. Blankenship had been on the island since about 1960 as the result of an article on Oak Island published in Reader's Digest. He was so convinced he could solve the puzzle, he sold everything and moved to the island. He is still there. The landmass of Oak Island is owned by Oak Island Tours Incorporated. That's 78% of the island. And the uh, two owners of that are Mr. Dan Blankenship, who owns 50%, and Mr. David Tobias, who owns 50%. Mr. David Tobias is the CEO of the company and has controlling vote. The other 22% of the island is owned by Mr. Fred Nolan, who owns lots 9 through 14, and a Mr. Robert Young, who, lots, who owns lot number 5. And that's the way the island, the land mass of the island is split up. From a real estate point of view, Oak Island hardly meets the criteria of an excellent location. On the other hand, if digging for treasure is what your life is all about, owning your own island complete with stories of pirates, playwrights, and plunder, you could hardly find a more enticing spot. Treasure trove licenses are issued by the province of Nova Scotia, and on Oak Island in particular, the three owners have their own licenses to explore on the island for any treasure or archaeological or geographical significance that may be found on the island. Most of the exploration in recent years has been carried out uh, by drilling for core samples. And the core samples are in, looking for indication of uh, deformities in the, in the surface of Oak Island. And as a result of that, there have been metal findings. There's been wood findings to indicate shafts. And there's also been findings of coconut fibers, which are not indigenous to this area. And this supports some of the theory of the treasures that are supposed to be hidden in Oak Island. The Triton Corporation immediately began a series of test drills around what they believed to be the original location of the money pit, eventually drilling down to almost 200 feet. And here, if you'll pardon the pun, the mystery deepens. The drill plunged through into a cavern in the island's bedrock. Somewhere in the distant past, a significant underground project seems to have been carried out under the island, and as always, the elusive question, why? Over the years, the search has evolved around two locations, the actual site of the money pit, and also 140 feet northeast was the site called Borehole 10X, which was an exploratory hole dug by Triton Alliance back in the 1970s. Uh, from this, they made some pretty amazing discoveries. At the bottom of this shaft, which is 230 feet, a chamber was discovered, a water-filled chamber. A camera was lowered into the water and it sent back images that appeared on the monitor to be a human form. Also chest, perhaps oaken chest, and also items such as tools that may have been dropped into the shaft over the years. The question of who could have built this astonishing masterwork was beginning to take on major proportions. The answer to that question just might provide the answer to what, if anything, was there. That conclusion appears, on the surface at least, to be what drives the ongoing search, in spite of a string of spectacular failures, stories of curses, and the simple fact that not so much as one thin dime has ever come out of the so-called money pit. Yet all this seems to have had no effect on the treasure seekers at all. It's not so much the treasure that draws people to Oak Island as the mystery. Just about everyone who is involved in Oak Island at present is more interested in learning the answers to, and uh, the solution to the mystery than to getting rich by selling treasure. 
For over 200 years, men and machines have been trying to discover the answers to these questions. With ever-increasing determination and the latest technologies, experts in various fields of endeavor have put everything they have, including their very lives, into solving this puzzle. The last 10 years has been a relatively quiet period on the island. Probably the only thing of significance was in 1995. We did have a team from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, the same people that were involved in locating the Titanic. They spent two weeks on the island. Their survey of both the island and the bay surrounding the island certainly did nothing to discourage us that a treasure does exist on Oak Island. The most recent activity in Oak Island was in 1999, and we had a private company come in under contract with Oak Island Exploration Company, and they did uh, drilling and core sampling to uh, find any voids that may have been in the, in the earth. This would indicate that some of the voids would, would be attributed to shafts, etc. That would indicate that there was some treasure or something hidden down there at one point in time. Could it be that the answer will be found by digging into history rather than digging on the island? Will finding out who was there and when tell us what might still be there? Is it possible the riddle was solved nearly half a century ago by a four-year-old girl? Certainly one of the driving forces that keeps the Oak Island quest alive is the strange inscription on the stone discovered at the 90-foot level by those first diggers. In 1987, a retired senior editor of the National Geographic made an identical translation to the one provided by the Halifax University language professor. The editor said he simply applied Edgar Allan Poe's translation system from the gold bug. The symbol appearing most frequently will be an E, since that is the most frequently used letter in the alphabet. Here, it would be the two dots stacked vertically. The second word, then, is blank E, E, blank, and a buried treasure that can only be feet. We now have the symbols for F and T, which are also in the first word, obviously a number. The word 40 fits the letter placements, which now give you O, R, and Y, 40 feet below, and so on. That would seem to work. What's more, the message, along with the method of coding, strongly suggests a pirate treasure. But did pirates have the technology it would require? Could they get along with each other long enough to complete any sort of building project, let alone something as complicated as the money pit? Perhaps they were more resourceful than we have been led to believe. And there are other clues that have a pirate's touch. There are those stones in the shape of a large triangle that were discovered on the south shore pointing like an arrow toward the treasure. But what if the copy of the transcription on the stone is a hoax? There's actually no evidence available to support any interpretation of the inscription because we don't have the actual inscription. It was never written down. It was lost before it was ever created on any documentation. I believe that the actual inscription we have today is a forgery created by a later writer. What if Harvard professor Barry Fell had the correct translation? What does that tell us is at the bottom of the money pit? I believe that uh, when the Arif died, his people decided to bury him in a tomb. They found a very huge pit, it was 100 feet deep, and they just kept away from it. It was a sinkhole. Earlier religions, including early Christianity, believed that the answer after death was to go down to the river of life. And I believe they put him down to what they considered the river of life. They put the stone on top of him, and then they built, they filled it in gradually, and about every 10 feet, they wedged timbers into the walls of the pit so that the combined weight of the earth would not collapse the tomb itself. That's an interesting theory, but many experts believe it ignores too much hard evidence of actual treasure. Take, for example, the pot shards and traces of mercury. At the time, liquid mercury was used as a preservative for documents. Also, the small piece of parchment that was discovered on the end of a drill bit. If you were really intending to bury a treasure and have no one else ever find it, why would you leave so many surface clues? The original builders left a noticeable depression in the earth, 
Legend holds a block and tackle was left hanging from a tree branch directly over this depression. That's like putting up a neon sign that says, hey, dig here. In addition, oak logs were buried every 10 feet in the shaft. It was almost like a signpost that read, you're on the right track to find the treasure. Then buried at 90 feet, the builders left an inscription that's been translated to read, 40 feet below, two million pounds are buried. In other words, keep digging. Just a few feet below the inscribed stone was where the first water trap was triggered. Oak Island is like a puzzle, and once you become involved in trying to solve the mystery, it becomes an addiction. That certainly seems to be the case, and not all the pieces of this particular puzzle can be found in the money pit. Mr. Fred Nolan, who has quietly purchased a small portion of Oak Island, has taken a more archaeological approach. Mr. Nolan has identified four 10-ton boulders, which he says are deliberately placed to form a huge cross. At their center is a large sandstone. Many people believe this is a credible theory, but over the years, many theories have been put forward as to who may have constructed such an elaborate system. Take, for example, an enterprising engineer by the name of Edwin Hamilton, who spent four years excavating the island prior to World War II. The original burying of the treasure there uh, probably uh, at that time was quite an engineering feat. And I doubt very much if it could have been carried out by pirates or a pirate crew. Uh, the fact that uh, they used water for flooding and that uh, uh, hydraulic engineering was involved would lead me to believe that it was French in origin rather than British and that uh, it was very likely to be the treasure from Lewisburg that might have been buried there by the men that uh, left Lewisburg along with the treasure on the three vessels. They were uh, capable of such work. It's a possibility since the fortress of Lewisburg is just a two-day sail away from Oak Island. Lewisburg was a large French outpost on the northern coast of Nova Scotia. It served as a challenge to British colonialism and the New World. At one time, it was the third largest seaport in North America behind Boston and Philadelphia. But the fortress fell to the British in 1768. However, before surrendering its gates, three French ships did manage to slip away. Hamilton believed these ships might have brought an enormous amount of wealth to Oak Island, since the island is a short distance away. And it's entirely conceivable that the fortune of a great French fortress was in the holes of these ships. Research shows that by 1768, the area surrounding Oak Island was sufficiently populated that any clandestine activity on the island would have been noticed by someone. Therefore, the Lewisburg theory just doesn't hold. After all, those three French ships would have been seen by someone, and no one ever did see them. According to Thomas H. Rattle's History of Halifax, the British fleet and army, fresh from the plunder of Havana, arrived in Halifax and began an unbelievable spending spree. Rattle describes a scene of unrestrained revelry as gaunt, sunburned adventurers with enormous loot were literally throwing it at tavern keepers throughout the city. It is possible that the British Army and Navy dug the money pit as a place to hide the untold wealth plundered from Havana. Certainly they had the manpower to do it, and under the strict command of hard-bitten professional officers, the task might well have been accomplished. And by any measure, the amount of plunder, if indeed it came from Havana, would make it worth the effort. Still, there is nothing to confirm that the British soldiers ever left the taverns of Halifax in order to go dig pits and tunnels on Oak Island. Or is there? In the late 1930s, a four-year-old girl named Peggy Adams, who lived on the island with her parents, claimed to have seen something very strange. Mama, Mama, come and see! Come and see! Honey, stop shouting! What are you talking about? Come with me, Mama! Wait! I'll tell you! They're right here, Mama! Soldiers in red coats! Red coats? Sure, honey. And you brought me all the way out here in this cold. Peggy Adams never backed away from her story. In fact, the way she told it, she seemed to be describing a large number of these soldiers. 
parents, of course, were having none of it. Then some years later, on a trip to Halifax, Peggy's mother took her to visit the Citadel there, which includes a museum. That's them. Those are the men I saw. What Peggy saw was an effigy of a British soldier in the uniform that was standard in the British Army from 1754 to 1783. Could it be that a youngster of four, innocent of greed or avarice, actually witnessed a ghostly watch that returns from time to time to see if their plundered treasure still lies safely at the bottom of the muddy?